The Economic Development and Small Business Subcommittee on Housing will come to order. Will the clerk please take the roll? Chair Coleman. Here. Representative Stevendorf. Stone. Here. Scott. Present. Andrews. Grant. Here. Cernoglu. Here. Aragona. Maddox. Here. Um, Zorn. Fink? Here. DeBoyer? Here. Mr. Clerk, you have a, or Mr. Chair, you have a form. Clerk, will you please read in the letter from Speaker Tate from March 7th, 2023? Dear Mr. Clerk, I am making the following changes to the committees for the 102nd Legislature. Representative Matt Maddock will be removed from the Subcommittee on Housing. Representative Angela Regas will be removed from the Subcommittee on Housing. Representative Dale Zorn will be added to the Subcommittee on Housing. Representative Jay DeBoyer will be added to the Subcommittee on Housing. Sincerely, Joe Tate, Speaker of the House. Thank you. Representative Stone moves to adopt the minutes from the meeting on March 2nd. Thank you. The meeting minutes from March 2nd are adopted. I want to thank uh, members of the committee for our, a great first meeting uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and I want to welcome uh, well, we have uh, Rep. Zorn, who's going to be coming in, and, and uh, also welcome to Representative DeBoyer. Would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself to the committee? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Uh, Jay DeBoyer, I'm a 63rd House District, uh, which is Southern St. Clair County, Northern Macomb County. Um, I do have a background in housing, to, to uh, single-family housing, multiple-family housing, um, so it's... Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this committee with you guys. Representative Zorn. I uh, represent the 34th District of Runaway County. And 
This is my uh, 43rd year in elected continuous services. So I'm real happy to be here and be a part of it. Uh, I want you to know my family is involved in housing. We have uh, four kids and 11 grandkids. It's great to have you. You got a full house. Um, <laughs> Today we have a presentation from housing attorney Jim Shafsma with the Michigan Poverty Law Program. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Shafsma. Did I say that right? You did. Excellent. I've heard. And when you're ready, uh, you can begin. I've heard many variations uh, otherwise. And uh, thank you, uh, Chair Coleman and members of the committee, uh, for your invitation. It's my pleasure to be here, and I look forward to our conversation uh, today. It's been more than three years since I've sat in one of these chairs, so a little nostalgic today. I've done some Zoom uh, hearings, um, and fortunately can be maybe a little less time pressured than I'm used to as a, a witness on bills, but rest assured that you know, my presentation will be concise and look forward to your questions and conversation uh, about housing issues. So. Um, as you heard, I'm Jim Shaftsma. I am the housing attorney at the Michigan Poverty Law Program. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Poverty Law Program uh, supports the work of legal advocates for Michigan's low-income residents, as well as working with many other groups and constituencies, community-based organizations, human services organizations, other nonprofits, uh, local government, uh, and by support, you know, what I mean uh, is that we assist those who are doing advocacy. Probably our primary constituency uh, is legal aid programs, so do a lot of work in consultation uh, with them about cases and issues that they're dealing with. And then beyond that, and that is work that we do statewide, uh, beyond that we engage in systemic advocacy to help alleviate barriers faced by Michigan's low income residents. So that takes various forms. Um, legis legislative advocacy is one of them. Uh, do administrative advocacy uh, as well. I do a lot of work with MISHTA and heard from Kelly Rose um, there who was one of the speakers uh, last week or two weeks ago now that she had uh, a good time with you and appreciated your input and questions. Um, and then do a lot of work within the court system uh, as well. So I welcome this opportunity uh, today to talk to you about housing issues. And you know what I thought might be helpful uh, to do um, at the start is to offer you know, a perspective on uh, Michigan's housing profile, so the status quo in Michigan. And I should say that I work primarily on rental housing issues, uh, but I also do work on single family issues. One of my colleagues, so I should have also said that um, besides supporting work on housing issues, we also provide support on consumer law issues, public benefits issues, family law issues, and elder law issues. Uh, so my uh, consumer law colleague, Larray Brown, um, specializes among other issues on mortgage foreclosures and I heard that that was a topic of some conversation last week so uh, she had another commitment today but um, I know a fair amount not as much as she does about foreclosure issues so you know if you want to engage those issues I'm happy to but uh, my primary focus will be on rental housing issues and you know what you have here uh, is a housing prof profile prepared by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which, which does great work uh, in this area, both in research it does and in compiling, and I think very effectively uh, presenting uh, research of others, primarily government entities, so we're talking Census Bureau and HUD uh, on housing issues. So I think this slide does a better job than I could in, in, in an in an encapsulated form of presenting a lot of useful information about the housing scene in Michigan, particularly for uh, its low income residents, which is the constituency um, who I primarily advocate for. But you know, as you can see, about 28% uh, percent of uh, Michigan's renter households are extremely low income. So there are three categories of low income, extremely low income, which is 30% and below the area median income low income, which is between 30 and 50% of area median income, and then, uh, I'm sorry, very low income, and low income, which is between 50 and 80%. So 28% um, 
percent of uh, total renter households are in that extremely low income category. And I think it's coincidental, but that 28% number roughly approximates the percentage of Michigan households who are renters. Um, so there's some fluctuation. It depends whether you look at some Federal Reserve numbers or uh, Census Bureau numbers. The home ownership rate in Michigan is somewhere in the range of 72 to 73 percent. I haven't seen 2022 numbers. My guess is it's going to slide a bit that there's been you know, a fair amount of sale and um, some of the members could speak to it of single family properties converted from home ownership into rental. So I think that the home ownership rate is uh, probably going to see some decline in it. It's not going to be remarkable. But anyways, that's a, a bit of an aside. And you know, this next um, point of there being this huge shortfall in rental housing that is affordable and available for extremely low income renters is a topic that I hope to stress with you today. And so, you know, there are in that category a substantial number of renter households that get um, federally subsidized housing assistance, but contrary to what I think is um, widespread belief, only about one in every four households that qualify or are income eligible for that assistance actually get it. Um, so most families, low-income families, do not get um, housing assistance. And I think what this number also reflects is that there's been a decline in what is commonly referred to as naturally occurring affordable housing. So uh, housing that is in the private market affordable. So you know the data shows that that um, piece of affordable housing is is declining and that's very distressing and we can talk about some of um, the foundations or the underpinnings of that problem um, so here's and, and this will be a point um, that that I come back to as well so you can see what the this is a statewide number um, the top line income amount um, for a family of four to be extremely low income. And then you see this next number, so that's the 26,200. The next number, um, close to 40,000, that's what it takes a family um, in income, annual income, to afford a two-bedroom unit at what's called the fair market rent. So that's a HUD figure. And I think that's commonly thought to be an average rent, but it's not. It's rent at the 40th percentile, so it's actually a below average um, rent. So, I mean, if we are using the average rent, that number would be even, that 39,731 number would be even higher. Uh, and so uh, that gap, I think, really uh, very well illustrates the affordable housing crisis that we have in Michigan. And, you know, that uh, crisis doesn't affect only families in this extremely low income category, it's creeping up uh, in the income ranges. So more families in that next category, very low income, and into the next category, low income, and even creeping into above 80%, so more moderate income, uh, income ranges that affordable housing is uh, becoming less and less attainable. And you can see this next number, and I'm not going to do too much statistical talking, but I think this one is, to me, very jarring. And what it shows is that um, nearly three quarters of, the fam of families in this lowest income uh, category are what's called severely rent burden. And that means that they're paying more than 50% of their income towards their housing costs. It's Cost. The standard measure of housing affordability uh, is housing costs that consume 30% or less of a household's income. So when a family is paying more than 50% of its income toward housing, it's in a very fragile you know, situation that that's simply not enough money to meet other costs and obligations. And so you know, if there's a car repair that's needed uh, to get someone to work, it might make paying rent hard. And that's sometimes how uh, the spiral into eviction, which I plan to talk a bit about, um, starts to happen. So um, then there's some other charts, I think, that are also uh, informative. Another really uh, useful device that the National Low Income Housing Coalition has come up is uh, what it calls its housing wage. So this is the amount on an hourly basis, full-time work, 
that it takes a family to afford a two bedroom unit at that fair market rent, which is a below average uh, rent. So you can see the number um, for the state. Uh, and then for its most expensive areas. And I'll say that for um, those four most expensive areas, um, fair market rent, I'm sorry if I'm getting a little too technical here, but is computed um, by metropolitan area. So it's the entire metro um, or county in the case of non-metro uh, communities. So Detroit, Warren, Livonia, that's, it also includes uh, Oakland County. So it's a very diverse uh, range. But there also, you can dig deeper, there are what are called small area fair market rents, which um, provide information about uh, rents at the zip code level. And for um, areas in each of those for uh, most expensive areas. Um, there are places where it would require a family $35, sometimes more than $35 an hour, uh, an hour in income. So we're talking 70,000 um, potentially plus um, dollars a year to be able to afford housing. So you know what we have is a really significant uh, gap that there is a mismatch, especially for uh, lower income families. Uh, between incomes and rents. So there is some you know, dysfunction uh, in, the, in the private rent market. And I, I think that's really, um, from, from my perspective, almost beyond dispute. And unfortunately, um, the problem is only getting uh, worse. But I think this is a really useful way to think about um, housing costs to use this um, device called the, the housing wage. Uh, just wanted to talk about some recent, and these are, well, a combination of state and federal, but recent housing policy interventions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you may recall that there was a COVID emergency rental assistance program uh, known as CIRA. Here's a screenshot from the CIRA uh, website. And what that did was use ARPA, and there was also money from a Consolidated Appropriations Act at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, um, that also provided funding for this program. And it was a substantial amount of emergency rental assistance, and it um, offered many families housing stability during this very difficult period and prevented a lot of families from getting evicted. And as you can see, you know, paid landlords a lot of money as well. So almost $900 million um, was paid to landlords by way of this CIRA program. Um, so thank you to, the, to those of you who were in the legislature um, in 2020 and 2021, well, actually 2021 and 2022 for you know, using these federal dollars to create this uh, program. It did a lot of good. I mean, the downside is that that money has been mostly, almost entirely exhausted. Um, not all of it was used. Some of it, fortunately, um, was appropriated for uh, affordable housing, low-income housing development, and I'll touch on that issue uh, a bit. But it did a lot of good. There's still one piece of the program that remains. It's what's called housing stability. Uh, services, so direct financial assistance to tenants and their landlords and to utility providers no longer as it exists. Um, but there are these housing stability services, which includes um, services such as case management for families that are at risk of eviction, uh, as well as money for legal services to assist uh, families dealing with potential eviction issues. Um, as well, and I'm a little fuzzy on this number. There may be some who could uh, define it better. I looked, there were several appropriations acts last year. Um, there was also additional money from ARPA, from the state and local um, relief fund um, that provided, by my estimation, about $300, $300 million for uh, development of low to uh, moderate income housing. Um, and more recently, you know, what the legislature did um, last month um, was um, pass what became Public Act 4, uh, which provides up to $50 million a year to the Housing and Community Development Fund. And, you know, that is money that Michigan really needs to address this affordable housing crisis. And 
I think before this money was appropriated, that only $3 million of state general fund money had been appropriated to uh, this fund, or really, I, in, in, to my understanding at least, um, to any affordable or low income housing purpose. Almost all the money that the state has used to address uh, affordable and low income housing issues has been federal pass through money. So in, in different ways, and we can talk about some of those programs. Uh, for example, the low income housing tax credit program, uh, the section eight programs. Um, so, th so that's great. It's, um, we need much more to um, forcefully respond to the affordable uh, housing crisis, but really pleased to see um, that the state has recognized that it has um, some fiscal responsibility to um, provide its funds to address um, this problem that is affecting more and more households. Um, this one might be a little fuzzy, thought it might be helpful. I was talking about the, the CIRA program. This is some data from the state court administrative office showing some trend lines for eviction uh, cases pre-pandemic and then um, after the onset of the pandemic. And you know what you can see is that um, upon the onset of the pandemic that the eviction case filing numbers plummeted. And what you can also see is they each year have been creeping upward. So they're not quite approaching uh, the levels that they were pre-pandemic, but they're getting closer uh, and closer. So, you know, that is an issue um, of concern and um, one for which you know, I, I, I know that there are some potential policy responses and, and there have been some good um, policy responses to them. So. Um, and now, you know, I was asked to talk about um, <clears throat> possible housing policy responses to um, what I hope and I don't think I needed to convince um, you that there is an affordable housing crisis in the state. Um, certainly increasing units um, supply is, I think, the predominant um, issue and, and I hope can be a primary goal of the legislature. It's not easy. You know, I recognize that it is expensive to create uh, new housing. And you know, this, this um, need goes beyond uh, the low income realm, certainly, as you know. But, um, and also, you know, as a um, counterpart to it, um, that there is a need to preserve existing low income units because sadly, um, those units are being lost faster than they are being replaced. So um, I think some of the money that's been, that, that the legislature has invested in uh, development of low and moderate income housing will help to reverse that trend. And I could talk a lot about these threats to the preservation of existing low income units. Sometimes it's that, you know, there is a limited time period, uh, what's called a restricted use period that attaches to something like the low income uh, housing tax credits. And, you know, when that date arrives, that beyond that point that the income, that the rent restrictions, the low income related rent restrictions for those properties go away. So that's just an example and there are several other ones. But you know, one point that I, I hope you'll take away from this and it's I think somewhat self evident but that homelessness and eviction are housing problems. And that's kind of a duh, well of course they are. But by that I mean that they are primarily housing supply issues. So you know that there's a lot of, that, that, that probably the best cure for homelessness is to provide more housing to homeless people. And again, I, I, I think that's somewhat obvious, but I think it uh, deserves underscoring. So yes, I mean, there are other issues um, and um, concerns that cause people to become homeless, you know, whether it is um, mental health issues, uh, addictions, but, what the research does show is that the primary one is a lack of housing and that when people um, with other issues are housed and provided supportive services to deal with those other issues that they have a good record of retaining that housing. So um, that's the big challenge. So as you may know, um, last year the state adopted a housing plan. Its goal for um, the creation of new units is 75,000, and this isn't limited to low-income units. By 2027, um, the need 
as I tried to show earlier, is much greater than that. You know, I think addressing this supply um, concern as well is a need to think, you know, creatively about traditional housing policy. Um, so, you know, that can relate to zoning policy, you know, to thinking about ways to um, enhance density uh, in neighborhoods, in areas, um, thinking about other non-conventional types of housing. And I'm not advocating for any one in particular, but just uh, trying to point out the need to be thinking about these. There's um, that, that there are housing types such as what are called tiny houses or even um, 3D printed houses that are much less costly than traditional housing. So you know, my point is that we just need to be stretching the boundaries and thinking more creatively about how we might um, address this housing crisis. And also, you know, the need we had this CIRA program that was great for both tenants and landlords, so, um, but it's gone away. Um, and so um, I would challenge and hope that the legislature would consider um, ways to provide some permanent funding for emergency rental assistance. Some of that could come from the Housing and Community uh, Development Fund, but it would be great if there were um, perhaps specific appropriations for that purpose. Oh, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, in terms of other ways to potentially increase you know, opportunities, especially for low-income families, um, one is um, adopting source of income protection, which would prohibit discrimination you know, on the basis of what's known as source of income. And probably the program that this would most affect is the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. So choice is in its name, but um, families' ability to live in um, the areas of their choice is uh, severely constrained by another by a number of factors, not just discrimination, but also um, the value of these vouchers not being as high as it could be to enable them to move to so-called higher opportunity areas and um, things like uh, what are known as housing mobility programs, which um, provide service to both prospective tenants and landlords um, by way of better preparing uh, tenants for uh, moves and also providing resources to landlords that can be incentives. So Mishta had a program, maybe you heard about it for a while, that provided an upfront incentive for landlords willing to participate in this program. So I think it's a combination uh, of those things. <clears throat> Another possibility is what's known as eviction record sealing. It could also be called limited access to eviction uh, case records, um, that that's often an impediment um, in eviction history to tenants or to a person seeking a new tenancy. Um, and it doesn't only affect tenants who have been evicted, who have had an eviction case judgment uh, entered against them. Just because, and I, I make reference <clears throat> to it below, but tenant credit reporting, um, that there is widespread now in the rental housing space, um, the use by landlords, and it's happening more and more of um, reports from these tenant credit, credit reporting agencies. And so um, th th that's a, a flourishing industry. So. The big three credit reporting agencies each have their own uh, separate tenant reporting agency. So TransUnions is called Smart Move, um, Experience is called Connect, and then there's a number of uh, other ones. So what they do, among other things, is do what's called scrape eviction uh, case records. Uh, and what they do and compile not only that information, but other information for landlords. And what's becoming more and more commonplace is that those reports using pretty sophisticated algorithms make a recommendation to a landlord about, based on inputs that the landlord has approved, whether or not to approve a tenant's application. Um, but what's problematic uh, in uh, some of those practices is that when we're talking about eviction records, uh, it's not just 
uh, the record of a tenant against whom a judgment is entered. That can be a so-called derogatory item on a tenant credit report. It can be the mere fact of a uh, tenant or former tenant having had an eviction case filed against him and her or him or her, regardless of the outcome uh, of that case. So um, that goes beyond, I, I think, when we're looking at um, the immensity of our housing challenges, goes beyond what you know I regard as a legitimate uh, tenant screening device. Another kind of more specialized looking at housing admissions issues uh, area are what are commonly known as fair chance um, laws. So these have happened in some states and uh, localities, but uh, limit landlords' ability to use uh, criminal history as a basis for denying um, an application. And in most instances, there's, there's variations, they're, they're on a spectrum. In most instances, it doesn't prohibit a landlord from looking at criminal history, but it might impose a look back period you know, as to how far back a landlord could look at criminal history um, might require consideration of the nature of uh, criminal history and in many instances requires a landlord to make a so-called individualized assessment about um, the criminal history of, of a tenant applicant. Um, you know, I've touched, touched a little and want to keep moving on limits on tenant credit reporting practices. There's some convergence there between that and eviction record ceiling. Um, <clears throat> another um, area of concern are you know, costs of housing. Um, and what we're seeing more and more, and I get reports about it uh, very frequently, um, are additional fees beyond rent that landlords charge tenants. So those include application fees and often extremely hefty uh, application fees. And so I think there are ways um, to address that issue um, and it can talk about them uh, more. And seeing increasingly um, so-called junk fees um, beyond rent. So these can be the ones we've seen in other areas, uh, convenience fees, administration, uh, fees that is really just an add-on to rent. Oftentimes, um, a tenant isn't receiving any service uh, for it, but then you know, it extends into um, other areas uh, as well. I mean, one common one I regularly hear about are so-called month-to-month premiums. So a tenant who's not living under an annual lease and is living on a month-to-month -month basis, I've heard reports that um, they are required to pay a premium, an additional $500 a month um, to be a month-to-month -month tenant, which far exceeds a landlord's costs of having to um, deal with a month-to-month -month tenant as compared to a tenant living under an annual lease. And um, I could go on that um, the, the range of these fees is really uh, only limited by the creativity of, of those um, coming up with them. But I think it's, a, it's, uh, it's really a, um, a, a transparency and fairness point, these, these junk fees. Oftentimes, tenants don't know. And yes, some if, a, if a tenant had carefully read the lease, might have seen them, but thought their obligation was to pay rent, and they do that, and then get a bill from a landlord saying, well, there are these additional charges um, that, you have, um, that, that you have to cover. Uh, and so, you know, you can see what I'm proposing here, that, that rent needs to include the basic services necessary for occupancy and where, when there are additional fees, they have to be reasonable at or near cost. And that service, you know, has to be, has to be, or should be optional. Uh, rent late fees is another area where we're seeing higher and higher fees. So the purpose of a late fee is to compensate a landlord for the cost that a landlord occurs as a result of late payment of rent. Um, but what we're increasingly seeing is um, fees that go far beyond that, you know, running into um, you know, 75, 100. I've heard reports of $200 late fees that far exceeds um, the, the purpose or the limits of these so-called liquidated damages. Um, another practice is forced place insurance that um, tenants are required to get insurance, but that doesn't necessarily cover them, but can cover it, it, but needs to cover the landlord. And if a tenant doesn't 
um, get such insurance um, on their own, sometimes um, the landlord will in, it will purchase that insurance for them. That's what forced place is, or charge them an additional insurance fee uh, on a monthly basis. And heard of a lot of concerns too related to e-payment systems and their charges. So. Um, I, I think there's a, a need to address um, those issues as well. A um, couple of others, and, and trying to wrap up here, um, of tenant protections um, are related to the eviction process. We'd be happy to talk about those. Um, tenant uh, right to organize. So Michigan law indirectly uh, recognizes that right, but doesn't do so in a direct way. Um, and this is uh, maybe a more specific example, but um, the possibility of a right of first refusal for tenants of rental property that's for sale. And one area where this could be really useful and has been in some other states, and it's not easy, it's difficult, um, but is pre pr providing that opportunity to tenants in manufacturing housing communities and in mobile home parks. Um, because tenants of those parks who own uh, their homes are especially vulnerable and, and really are stranded uh, just because of the, uh, for many of them, almost prohibitive costs of moving uh, those mobile homes. I um, wanted just, as I said, my colleague uh, LaRae Brown was not able to join us today, but um, one of our projects has been the foreclosure prevention uh, project. So here's some information about that, you know, as well. And you may be familiar with this program. It's kind of, roughly speaking, uh, the homeowner's counterpart to the CIRA, to the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, but this My Half Fund, you know, which provides uh, assistance to families, owner families, uh, who are facing um, a housing crisis, particularly in the form of a uh, mortgage payment challenge, which uh, could potentially lead to foreclosure of that mortgage. So um, that's what I have for you. I tried to keep it half an hour, went over a minute or two, but, um, and, and hope that's helpful um, to you and in, in getting a better understanding from my perspective, uh, at least of you know, what are some of the housing challenges that uh, families in this, particularly low income ones, um, face. And be happy to. Thank you for your presentation. I uh, appreciate it. There's some interesting ideas there, and uh, I know you're you're on the side of uh, people who are struggling and trying to make ends meet. So appreciate your advocacy and you being here. Um, are there any questions from the members? Okay, Representative Fink. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll stick to one question now, but if we have time, I wouldn't mind if you came back to me. So I, I want to say uh, I appreciated the screen that you had the slide I, actually I, should, I want to first say I couldn't read anything on the first couple of slides so if if you wanted to send that information around I couldn't read on the screen and it's it's too fuzzy here actually I think we may have gotten it in our email already okay all right so I'll take a look at that and if I have questions maybe I'll try to follow up if I don't forget um, I appreciate the slide you had there possible rental housing policy response to creating more units um, although I do think that the the housing plan goal of 75 New 75,000 new units by 2027 is probably undershooting what the market really wants. I appreciated that you're trying to uh, uh, recognize that the fundamental way in, in which to lower the cost of a good, including housing, is to pr have more of it to go around. Uh, so the seller doesn't have to sell it so uh, uh, at, at such a high rate in order to uh, meet, the, meet, meet where the demand is. But the next couple of slides to me, I'm just going to be honest here, seem to me to be completely out of touch with economics, I mean, with, with basic economic incentives. So, I mean, for instance, eviction record ceiling. I mean, how, why would we deny uh, the opportunity for a landlord to consider who it is that he's leasing to or she's leasing to? I mean, explain to me why it makes sense to tell a landlord, I want you to lease this to somebody, and I'm not going to tell you if this person has been a bad tenant in the past. Because they might not have been. I mean, that's, that's my point, that it's Yeah, but you, the way you want to do that is by saying you're not even going to find out about their eviction. I mean, obviously, I think it's totally true that a person can go through an eviction proceeding and, and you know, have, it, could, it could have been a case where the person uh, shouldn't have been filed on. Obviously, that happens. Or it could have been a case where the person paid it off later and the judgment was satisfied and they never filed a satisfaction of judgment or whatever. 
Well, why deny the landlord the opportunity to have that conversation by sealing the record? It's not deny. I, I, well, first of all, sorry about the projection issue. And no, okay. yeah, I, I saw that. If you look at the PowerPoint, if you uh, expand it, you can see those lines. But yeah, yeah. pardon me uh, for that. Um, well, because from my perspective, especially in cases where there hasn't been entry of a judgment that given, and I think this is all in context, uh, given the tremendous challenges that families, especially low-income families, face in getting uh, housing, that this is a reasonable limitation on what a landlord can consider, or I think more commonly, a tenant credit reporting agency can uh, continue. There's a lot of, and if I was uh, going to talk about tenant credit reporting practices, a lot of inaccuracies you know, on those reports, oftentimes related to uh, eviction cases, which I know isn't a direct uh, response to your question, but it's part of the larger uh, picture uh, and the need to address that. But it's a reasonable, eviction record ceiling is a reasonable limitation on landlord screening of applications while not denying um, them you know, access to information that is more predictive of uh, the likelihood of a of an applicant's success. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you're saying that there's something more predictive? I mean, if a person has gone through an eviction case before, you're, you're saying it's not predictive of, of what kind of tenant they'll be going forward? No, I'm comparing, um, what I'm doing is comparing tenants against whom judgments have been entered versus tenants against only an eviction complaint has been filed. So, and I think that's a very relevant uh, distinction and but the the reality is that in the tenant credit reporting area it doesn't make a difference when okay I'm going to move on to the uh, Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next next member but we'll come back if we have time uh, representative stone thank you mr. chair thank you for your testimony today um, I, I want to uh, circle back to the eviction diversion program during COVID and we know that was very successful in keeping people in place um, especially during uh, 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 you know, uh, pandemic <laughs> and, and uh, all the challenges that that presented. Um, one of the issues that a local landlord brought to my attention was that um, while renters knew that they could stay in place, that in order to apply for benefits, it had to be renter initiated. And so their request was, um, was there a way to uh, make that benefit approachable either from the renter's side or the landlord's side because they they weren't the recipient of those benefits even those those though those benefits were available um, do you know of any of uh, states that implemented it that uh, another approach that made those available directly to landlords I don't but I think the experience in Michigan was a little different uh, than reported that it, it was possible for landlords to apply as long as the tenant was a co-applicant. So a landlord could you know, initiate the process as long as the tenant went along with it. So couldn't do it independently of the tenant, but didn't need the tenant to initiate the process. Okay, we'll move on to Representative uh, Vice Chair Devendorf. Thank you for being here. You, um, so many of the policies that you mentioned, I am happy to say we're already working on. Um, so it, it, with respect to that, um, and as well as the um, note that having evictions on your rental record um, does get in the way of future opportunities, I, I want to make sure that our colleagues know that there is an opportunity to work on a lot of these these pieces of legislation. They are already in the works. And um, and, ad and address that from the conversations I've been having, and let me know if, if, you, if you agree or disagree. Um, we know that uh, having an eviction is a huge, huge contributor to whether you become houseless. Um, 
afterwards and in a in a continuous way. Um, in talking with with other stakeholders so far, we have seen support from both advocates for renters and for landlords for that particular measure to expunge evictions off of somebody's rental record um, because what has been aired as a priority to to landlords thus far is that the back pay that they are owed um, gets paid um, and they because they recognize the way a a single circumstance or or hardship at a time of life is not necessarily representative of what a renter is able to contribute and do on a consistent in a consistent way once to once they achieve stability. Um, so our landlords are advocating for just trying to get people up on what they owe what they owe um, that got them got them to the point of that eviction. Um, do you support? Um, I can never see around this so chair. <laughs> Sorry. Had a good do you do? You, would you support if we were to uh, explore uh, possible avenues for both ex both expunging the records and trying to find ways to make it easier for our renters to come current? Um, understanding that after missing three rental payments, that can feel um, insurmountable, and perhaps we might have to work with renters on, um, on helping them to come current in some way. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued and would be happy to be part of that conversation with that additional piece you would offered of um, possibility of some payment. Okay, great, thank you. As a condition. Any other questions from the members? Uh, Representative Cerniglou. Thank you, and you, you may have already uh, covered this, so I apologize if I missed that part. Um, for the evic eviction record sealing, um, what, what was the process for that again, and did that apply to like multiple records, or was that just one record? It, it varies. Um, so there have been different responses to it around uh, the country, and it can you know, vary, as I was trying to say, depending on the nature or, or the disposition the outcome of the case, you know, what records might be subject to sealing and what which might not, and when um, the uh, sealing takes effect, uh, because these tenant credit reporting agencies are constantly scraping that data. So oftentimes it can be within days of an eviction filing, again, regardless of the outcome of the case that it's reported, you know, on a tenant credit report. So. Um, it, it oh, I see. So some, in some cases, it's not an actual, um, you know, eviction. It's just... Right, not a judgment. Uh, against a judgment, them. sure. Yes. And we'll go back to Representative Fink. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if we could talk maybe for a second about the next slide here, limits on fees and lease provisions, et cetera. I mean, I guess it actually kind of relates to the, to the previous questions I was asking, but, you know, the basic position that markets thrive on information and... Don't you think it's true that if you continue to sort of restrict how, you know, whether these fees are charged, I mean, we, if you want, we can talk about like whether a month to month fee ha makes sense for real market reasons. It sounds like you think it's sort of a uh, market inefficiency that people are able to take advantage of. We can get into that if you want, but my real point is if the landlords want to charge these fees, don't you think that uh, if you say they can't charge the fee, it'll just drive up the cost of rent generally? Oh, yeah, I don't dispute that. I mean, I think that would be an outcome. Um, but I think that, um, one, you know, there would be much more transparency. So in many instances, um, these are tenants know what the rent is and what's advertised as the rent. And so that's what they, spe what, what they think they are liable for. So I think it's the surprise factor um, that, and yes, I mean, we're dealing with tenants who are often not tremendously sophisticated. So it's significantly a transparency uh, issue. Uh, and, you know, it is also then the amount of those fees. And so, um, yes, from a economic efficiency that, you know, there should be correlation, um, in my view, I mean, when we're talking about a necessity like housing, you know, which is not an optional consumer item. Uh, that there needs to be that kind of correlation between 
the cost and the, the, the charge and what a, a landlord. You're essentially saying that the state should set the price of the good that the landlord is offering to the tenant. No, I'm not saying that as to rent, but as to these other costs, yes. Yeah, because I mean, rent, rent should you just be said that, that, I mean, these these costs, like whether, whether we, I actually, I, I wonder about your, your, your point about transparency, because it seems to me if we say that there's a fee for cleaning, which can't, you know, which uh, you can't use your security deposit for, right? I mean, so we have to say if we're going to charge a cleaning fee, it's a fee, right? And if we say there's a pet fee, or if we say there's a what are your fee, junk fee, or whatever, whatever the the variety of things you're putting in there, isn't there a certain transparency there that gets obscured if we just raise the rent instead? I mean, it, in other words, the tenant has a better, a fairer chance of understanding what it is their landlord thinks they need to be compensated for, if it's broken down into constituent fees rather than just the rent itself. Is your you understand the yeah the question I understand I'm asking what you? you're saying? I'm thinking. My, my point is, practically speaking, um, from the reports that I get, that it's not working that way, that we're not talking. And I think what it also underscores is the tremendous um, disparity in bargaining power between tenants and landlords. So yes, I think that there needs to be some constraints on efficient market practices in this space um, to compensate for those tremendous inequities. Okay. I mean, we probably couldn't hash all that out even if Rep. Coleman wasn't so indulgent, so I appreciate that, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I guess the last thing I'd say then is actually on that exact point that you just left it on, do you see distinctions that you would want to make between large landlords and individual landlords? For instance, a late, I mean, you, we can say that a late fee uh, is unreasonable. Obviously, courts say this all the time. L late fees are unreasonable if they're more than a, you know, corresponding to the direct cost that a landlord experiences. But I mean, if you're a small landlord renting out, you know, one, two, three, four houses, you're usually using the rent that you're paid every month to pay your mortgage. So in other words, you would really disincentivize that type of housing provision if you didn't make some distinct, if you got all your wishes, but didn't make some distinction between small landlords and large ones, I mean, what, don't you think you'd be creating a, a, an issue there of, of incentivizing or disincentivizing small landlords from putting their houses on the market? I'll think about it um, some more, but um, you know that's if we're talking about a mortgage, that's a fixed cost uh, that a landlord has, anyways. So, uh, well, but the late fee isn't it? If the, if the rent comes late and then their mortgage is late, the late, the late fee that they have to pay their bank and that's into their credit. Yeah, I mean we could go back. I think that's in part what reserve funds are for, and so I, we we could go back and forth on that. But I, I, I hadn't thought about. Uh, that distinction at much length, if at all. So I'm willing to give it thought. Okay, we have a, a question from another member. We're going to move on to Representative DeBoyer. Thank you, Chair Coleman. Just, you know, quickly, do you own or rent your home currently? Oh. You own. Are you a landlord? Do you rent? No. Okay. So <clears throat> I, I agree with the premise that that there is this shortage. Um, it's, it's across the board in housing, frankly. It's across the board in single family housing at, at market value. Um, it's also affordable housing, there's a shortage. But would you, would you speak to the point or, or agree or disagree that the more regulation we put on the individuals that, who are arguably providing this housing, um, the less palatable the desire may be to provide that housing? And secondarily, whose priority is it, or whose responsibility is it, to provide housing to these individuals who seek are seeking the housing right now? If you, if you may. Yes. So, you no. Know, as to the uh, first question, sorry. So, so, so essentially, the more re the more, more, re more regulation we put on to the individuals who are providing this housing currently, the less palatable that industry will look to them. So how do we address the shortage that we have with then putting more onerous requirement on them? How, how does that encourage people to come into the market and, and look at it as a um, palatable business option? Well, I, I don't think we're nearly um, at that point. And, and you uh, may think differently where um, regulation has reached that point of driving that. Uh, I mean, if you look at where the, the rate of rent, rent increases over time, 
uh, recent time I'm talking about that that's been very uh, compensatory um, and would more than uh, compensate for the, the regulations and the dis sure. what, what I think you might call the disincentivization mm. of um, additional regulation. Well, I think with the shortage that is, in, in our, I mean, I don't think it's arguable. It, it, it exists. I, I think that we got to be very delicate because um, the people that are providing this housing, th this isn't just out of the kindness of their heart. I think we all understand that. This is a business uh, venture. And so I don't want behaviors that come out of the legislature to discourage us from producing more housing, I guess, is, is my point. And, and I would think that, you know, I would love to hear more of your take on that, if you don't mind. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. We're going to move on to Representative Grant. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your time and focus on this work. I wanted to chime in as a landlord and a developer um, in this conversation and um, kind of a, I appreciate the pieces that are being given on potential policy when it comes to rental, but I also think when we're using the larger topic of housing, we have to address the cost of, and I'm not, I'm more making this a comment, um, but A, there's, there's nothing that's not incentivizing me to pro provide housing. And so we do have to make sure that landlords are not treating uh, long-term housing opportunities as we've seen some of the entities in short-term rentals being treated. The, these multiple fees that are added on are not necessary to make a profit. Um, and so as a landlord, I want to say that clearly, there's more than enough room for me to make profit in the market of rentals without charging cleaning fees and junk fees. That's not that that's not necessary and to protect our constituents to protect the people of michigan we have to make sure that they are not being unnecessarily uh burdened with fees because we see an exasperation not only in limited housing opportunities but we see an exasperation in houselessness and not protecting people from unnecessary fees will only make sure that there are more people who do not have a place to live. And we will see them in other places, in our emergency rooms, in our shelters, if we don't provide opportunities for housing for them. And rent, the fee of rent itself is more than enough to be covered um, for any of those other things. But I also uh, just wanna say that th this conversation today really, uh, to me, shines a light on the other issues outside of rental, which is the cost of development, which is ex insanely high. So we have to look at more than just our brick and mortar um, developments because as government, if we are stepping in and paying the cost for these really high projects, we're not helping the developers or the renters uh, because someone has to pay that fee. That fee has to be passed along. So if our, if our housing projects are costing millions of dollars more than they would have in 2019 and 2020, which they are, then someone has to, to pay that fee. And if the government steps in, that means that the, uh, we, we never see a lull in the work that people are doing. So we'll never see a decrease in the cost because oh, someone's paying, whether it's the government or a private entity is paying, someone's paying. Um, so we have to find other opportunities to address the those 75,000 units without paying these uh, really increased costs. Um, but also, there has to be opportunity for ownership here. If people are forever beholden to the fees in the terms of a landlord without ever seeing uh, an opportunity to on-ramp as an owner themselves, then uh, we will forever be asking, what's the place of the government to regulate what a landlord can do or cannot do? Um, 
And that's a really gray area to be in. So as much as we're having these conversations around rental, we have to have the conversations around costs, around what types of uh, projects are allowed, as you have listed here. Can planning and zoning expand what is allowable? And ultimately, uh, when will people have an opportunity to become owners themselves? Okay, and lastly, we will move to uh, back to Representative Cerniglou. Uh, so just real, real briefly, um, so I'm understanding correctly, um, with the limits on fees and lease provisions, um, you're not saying no late rent fees, just no excessive late rent fees, correct? Right. Yes. Okay. Because yeah, um, obviously, you know, if there's... If they meet what's called that liquidated right. damages test, a reasonable relationship between... The charge and the cost and that the absolutely right occurs because of late payment of rent. And and for the junk fees, you're not saying that these costs can't already be included in the rent, um, like if there's cleaning and, and all of those things, they can be included in the, in the rent. Just they would have, but you're saying just don't add them on um, as a later fee or something that might you know confuse people about how much they're really paying. Is that yes, kind of that's a fair. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just clarifying that. I mean, I've um, not in the housing industry at all, but have been a small business owner myself. And, you know, certainly we want to, you know, keep business owners um, whole, but no need to, uh, you know, be excessive. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank you again for coming in today. And, and uh, thanks to the members for all the lively discussion. I know there's a lot of different viewpoints here. Um, so I do appreciate everybody. Um, there's there being no absent members and no more business before the committee, the committee will stay adjourned. adjourn.